Welcome to Harmony United Methodist Church for our weekly virtual online worship service. This is the weekend of May the 3rd. I am Jeffrey Zalatoris, pastor here at Harmony, and I welcome you to our service time, and I am pleased that we are able to share this time with Elaine Stuckey providing music, with Matt Cole offering words of, as our liturgist, and David Elliott helping us with our technical production today. Friends, I'm glad we can share this time and that we might worship together, even in this virtual environment. Now at this time, I also want to share how we continue to pray for the day when we can return and gather again in community within the walls of the church. And we are starting to see glimmers of those signs on the horizon. And I am hopeful that we as a congregation will begin making those plans as we envisage how we return into a worship space and our gathering space again. And at this time, I, I invite the folks on the church council to begin thinking about ways we may transition back into the church building as we plan to meet and gather on May the 12th. Friends, I also continue to invite you to our Wednesday prayer and study Zoom meeting at 7 o'clock Wednesday nights. You can find information about that on our website with contact information on our events page. And if during the time of the worship service, you have a particular prayer, joy, or concern that you'd like lifted up, that during the premiere on Sunday morning, if you'd like to type that into your Facebook message, we can look at those together and offer those prayers together on Sunday mornings. Friends, let us prepare our hearts for worship with music.
Matt Cole. We're going to have our call to worship now, found in Psalm 23 in the New King James Version of the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now we'll have our opening prayer. Please pray with me. Uh, in, in your homes. Good and holy shepherd, guide us with your gentle hand. When we feel fear, revive us with courage. When we feel pain, grant us relief. In times of loss, help us recognize you, O oh God, as our gain. And in times of our success and health, open our eyes to the broken and the hurting to whom we may channel your mercy and compassion. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Now we'll have our epistle lesson. I once had a manager ask me if I, something I'd written. They said, did you write that epistle? And I said, yes, but I can't take credit for this one. This is from the first book of Peter, chapter 2, verses 21 through 25, if you'd like to follow along. For to this you have been called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Thanks be to God.
we continue our scripture lessons this morning with John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. Please listen with open hearts to these words. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hears his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. And I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Thanks be to God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Children of God, hear the good news. Christ is an example for you. Follow in Jesus' steps. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, may your example continually ignite a faith and a hope in us that we overcome our foolishness, and our waywardness, and may your life be the example that leads ours. Through Jesus the Christ we pray, amen. This letter called First Peter gave us these words that Christ is an example to us, and we ought to follow Jesus' steps. That Peter's letter joins many other writings that encouraged and urged the early Christian communities to stay faithful as disciples despite hardships and uncertainties. Friends, our readings today continue our Easter season, an exploration of the discipleship and the transition of disciples from those who were simply followers of Christ to those whom Christ gave agency and authority to go out into the world and to make new disciples and to proclaim repentance and the forgiveness of sins to the world and to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. These early disciples, they'd been mentored by Jesus for a time, months, years even, and Jesus called those disciples to walk alongside Jesus, 
to take up the yoke shared with Jesus and to share in the work of discipling, of proclaiming and healing, of feeding, clothing, sheltering, and welcoming. And when Jesus departed from his disciples, he'd made a promise to them that the Holy Spirit would join them and they would be yoked together with the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus himself had been yoked with the disciples, just as the Holy Spirit would in time be yoked with you and you and with me as disciples of Christ in our day, that we might move in the direction where God has called us into servanthood. So however we choose to name God, whether we call God by the name of Jesus or Holy Spirit, or Father or Mother, or Divine One, or Bright Morning Star, or Rock or Fortress, however we name God in our prayers, God has offered to be in ministry with us and not to oppose us, not to run against us, not to be in conflict against us, but to be in ministry yoked with us. We who call ourselves children of God. And if you choose to bear the name Christian, you have accepted that title and that name, child of God. And with that name, beloved, child of God comes responsibility to go where God calls and invites you to serve. And still those early disciples, those early disciples needed help in their transition as they moved from followers and apprentices to Jesus and to becoming the confident and assured bearers of their own crosses as they would go out and disciple and minister and mentor and to heal and to feed. They would be following Jesus's footsteps and I suppose at the time it would have been a daunting task for them to take to follow in Jesus footsteps for if any of you have ever been in a, in a job or place of work where somebody has used the phrase, oh, he's got really big shoes to fill. Or if you've ever heard the phrase, I'd hate to follow in her footsteps for those people who seem to be the most successful in their line of work. If you can imagine those situations in a workplace of following a person in their footsteps, can you imagine being those early disciples of the early church who had to follow Jesus' footsteps, had to walk in his, his sandals? We know it, it is not always simple or easy to step into the role of somebody else or to accept a leadership role when we ourselves felt rather comfortable not having that responsibility. Many of us know this in our own lives. And I myself, when, when I was in, uh, helping out with my son's Cub Scout pack, and the pack committee chairperson had left the position because of a surprise job transfer that would take him halfway around the world, there was a vacuum in that organization. And just as nature abhors a vacuum, an organization abhors a vacuum too, and someone would have to step in. At the time, I had plenty to keep me busy. Plenty of things at home and at work and at church, and even helping out with that Cub Scout pack. I was not seeking another position. I had no interest in being a leader of that level. And I felt completely unprepared Yet seeing the vacancy and recognizing I had time, and yes, I could actually take on that role for a year, I, I stepped into the position. Now the person I was following, I thought, had done a tremendous job. I felt I was stepping into somebody who was revitalizing that organization, and I felt like I could not meet the same expectations. He had worn big shoes and had worn them well, and I didn't think I could fill them. I felt unprepared and unworthy to step into that role. Now imagine the disciples again. They were being asked by Jesus to fill in, 
to step into his sandals and to walk where his feet walked. Imagine how unworthy the disciples must have felt to be asked to wear Jesus' sandals. How many of you would have felt comfortable being tasked as the first disciples to do that, to take on some of Jesus' responsibilities immediately after his departure? I think I might have wanted to be one of those unnamed disciples, the ones you don't read about in Scripture, the ones who don't quite make the headlines like John or Simon Peter. I wouldn't have felt worthy enough to step into those footsteps. Of course, God has a, a history of tapping into people who on the surface may not appear to be ready or prepared, may not appear to be worthy, and yet God has found a way time and time again to empower those folks to be sufficient, to be adequate, and even at times to be brilliant at advancing the kingdom of heaven and making things work out as God would like them to unfold. And so God does not call upon the disciples, does not call upon us as disciples to frighten us, but God has called through history disciples because they and we can rise to the occasion. We can be sufficient, we can be adequate, at times we might even be brilliant in those roles to advance the kingdom of heaven. Because God knows we can rise to the occasion. And from Jesus' words, and the words of the epistle writers, that is clear. God called disciples, and still today calls disciples, knowing that the disciples can answer the call, and that they will rise to the occasion. But even so, God knows disciples will be uncomfortable meeting tasks that are ahead of them. They may even feel a bit foolish that they are not worthy to be yoked up to God, but God knows that those whom God has invited into the sheep's pen can rise up and follow. God knows you and I can rise up. God knew the disciples of Jesus' time, too, would rise to the occasion that presented itself. God also knows we need encouragement to do this. And we need assurance to rise up to that occasion. And the letter to Peter moves our hearts and moves our heads to feel Christ's encouragement and assurance using these words. Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might live for righteousness. That word righteousness comes out of there. And it's a fine word meaning as God would ask us to live. So that Jesus bore our sins so that we might live as God would like us to live. As God has asked us to live. Friends, Jesus bore our sins on the cross. Not that we would ignore God. Not that we would expect other disciples to step in and do the work of God that God asks us to do. No, in this letter, Peter tells us Jesus bore our sins on the cross so that we would live as God asks us to live. So this letter, it encouraged and it urged the early disciples to live according to Jesus' example and his footsteps. Peter's letter also affirmed God as revealed in Jesus Christ as the shepherd and guardian of your souls, the guardian of your lives. Should you be invited and choose to enter into Jesus' flock. Recognize this. The Greek word meaning souls also means lives. The word suche. The Greek word commonly translated as soul can also be translated as life. So this statement in Peter's love letter is not just a statement of having souls protected in eternity, but of being in right relationship with God, living as God asks us to live today in this life. 
as well as in the next. That Jesus is guardian of our lives, both in this world and in the next. But friends, Peter's letter is not the only thing we read and heard this morning in the scriptures to offer us assurance and encouragement in ministry and mission. For John's gospel message also gave us two images, two of Jesus' I am statements as guardian of life. Hear these good news. Jesus said, I am the gate. To what? To the sheep's pen. And with these words, Jesus offered the courage to the disciples. As he said, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Yes, those who are saved do go in, but they also go out. Jesus reminds us that being saved is not the end point of discipleship, but its very beginning. We are saved not to be rewarded for past service and deeds, but we are saved so that we start serving, that we go out into the mission field. And so, yes, when Jesus says, those who enter will be saved, don't stop there. Read through to the end of that statement for you will come in and go out to the pasture. Jesus saves so the saved will work in the field and the pasture. Jesus saves so those who rest in the pen are ready to go out and to serve. Beloved children of God, the work is great, but the laborers are few. Those who are called to be saved are called to serve. Jesus said, I am the gate. And as the gate, Jesus saves disciples who are inside the sheep pen, just as Jesus will guard our souls and lives when we are in the secure feeling of a church community or in a church building. And it gets to be so nice and comfortable sometimes in those church gatherings and communities. But Jesus' message to the disciples that day wasn't to get comfortable. Jesus told the disciples they would come in and go out, out the back, out the gate. And when they go out the gate, they would be out and among the wolves and the thieves and the bandits. Beloved children of God, you as disciples, you are asked to go out of the church, out of the safe community of the sheep's pen, out to the pasture where you might serve. Now for those disciples, Jesus said he would be the, the gate at the pen, but what about the times when they are out in the field? I suppose the, the, the disciples must have asked that question next. If Jesus is the gate, then when they're out in the field, who will watch over and protect them? How will they be protected? And Jesus anticipated that question as we read through in the lesson. For Jesus had assured the disciples that he was guardian of their lives when they're together in the community, in their church. But then what happens when they walk out in service? Well, Jesus was ready with that answer. And his answer was this. For those times in ministry, we go outside the building or outside the safety of the walls of the pen. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the first thing he tells them, the most important quality of being that good shepherd is that Jesus says the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus protects and watches the sheep in the field to his fullest. And if the disciples didn't get it at first, this message goes over and over in John's gospel. In verse 15, he says, I lay down my life for the sheep. In verse 17, Jesus says, I lay down my life. Verse 18, he says, no one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Verse 18 again, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Like anyone with doubts or fears, 
the disciples may have questioned how far Jesus would go to protect them, to see their ministry flourish, to know that Jesus had their backs. And we read in John's Gospel over and over, Jesus telling them he will do everything for them, even to the point of giving his own life. They need not be afraid, but they may serve willingly and with confidence. And Jesus also says he will not only give his life, but give it by his own power. And yes, should he lay it down, he has the power to raise it up again. For the disciples, going out on their own after Jesus had died and was resurrected, would not words like these help overcome their doubts and insecurities? Would not the memory of Jesus' promises as guardian, as gate, as the good shepherd, give those early disciples courage and assurance when Jesus returned to them from the grave, for he had fulfilled that promise to them, the promise as guardian and gate and good shepherd? Would not the memory that Jesus had said, I have power to lay down my life and the power to take it up again, that the disciples would have confidence to take up that yoke of Christ, the yoke of God again, to step through the gate and into the field of ministry and servanthood, to, to put on the proverbial sandals and walk in his footsteps. Beloved children of God, there is a time and a place for every matter under heaven. And there is a time for being indoors and secure and safe, and there is a time to be out of doors and in ministry. Jesus calls us in, but also sends us out. And the good news is this, for disciples who are called by Jesus, whether you are inside or outside of the pen, Jesus will be protecting at the gate and watching as the good shepherd. Therefore, go. Follow Jesus' example. Follow the footsteps of Christ where God keeps you and where God sends you. And know, surely, goodness and mercy shall be with you all your days. Amen.
us be in a time of prayer together as we offer our prayers of intercession. For the blossoming faith of God's disciples that is grounded in the revelation of Jesus' love, we pray. Lord, have mercy for women and men who are called to vocations of healing and caregiving to be safe and strong and humble in their ministries, we pray. Christ, have mercy. For all of us who have sinned and fallen short of the image and likeness of God, to be convicted of God's mercy, to confess our sins, and to be comforted in God's forgiveness, we pray. Lord, have mercy. For men and women who answer the call to feed the world, the farmers and sharecroppers, food processors and packers, truckers, and deliverers, store clerks, and cooks, we pray. Christ, have mercy. And for the joys in our life that we lift before God, and for the concerns weighing on our hearts and minds and souls, we take this moment to call them to mind. Bless our petitions with your compassion, we pray. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Friends, we'll have a time of sharing of a peace in a virtual manner, and uh, I have to admit I am not a student of American Sign Language, but I've tried to learn the American Sign Language for Peace Be With You this week. I hope I'm close in my pronunciation. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. I will continue to invite and share this means of sharing the peace that when we return together in the congregation and the church, we may be offering signs of peace without actually the handshaking that is our tradition. So I invite you to start finding ways to share peace with one another uh, in new ways here. Also this day, we give our thanks to God. In so many ways, God has opened up our eyes to see Jesus Christ as Savior, as Good Shepherd, as Gate in our lives. And you as a congregation continue to respond through your generous gifts as you have experienced God's greatness in your own life. We know that you are offering in a way to continue to strengthen the ministries of this congregation. I invite you this week to continue to make those offers to the congregation that we may share. Let me offer our prayer for our offering this week. Gracious God, you have blessed us generously with life and love. We are a grateful people and give you thanks. And we offer you a portion of the work of our hands, that you may bless it and transform it to strengthen our mission, to love one another, the community, and the world. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let us join together in this time as we proclaim with confidence as the body of Christ, redeemed by Christ's grace, those words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
beloved children of God, may God who creates and redeems and sustains us bless you, forgive your sins, and secure your hope in everlasting life. May Christ the gate protect you in your coming in, and may Christ the good shepherd journey with you in your going out. Let us then, friends, go out to the world as servants to the Lord. Amen.